good morning, everybody. And uh, good morning, Tom. Great to see you this morning. Um, first of all, thank you all so much for joining um, at eight o'clock in the morning, bright and early, obviously early birds. Um, we're, but particularly grateful to you, Tom, for squeezing this in. I know you've had a particularly hectic few days, fresh out of the Farm to Fork Summit yesterday, and really appreciate you putting this into your schedule and extending your hours for the day to be with us. Um, so a very warm welcome to you. No, great to join you. And uh, yeah, really pleased that we were able to get it scheduled in. So Good, good. Um, so this is our usual format. We'll, Tom and I will be chatting for half an hour, really reflecting on the um, events of the last couple of days and some of the government announcements. Really keen to hear your, your views on some of that, Tom. But before we start, you're obviously um, relatively new in the role of NFU president, joined, um, started in that role in February of this year. And just to give people a little bit of a flavour of who you are, perhaps you could just tell us, I mean, obviously you're a farmer um, and you've been working with the NFU over a long period of time. Tell us how you, what, what made you decide that you'd go into the more sort of political policy end of, of farming? What's your sort of motivation there? Yeah, I mean, I, it's a really a strange story, really, Anna. I never had any interest in politics whatsoever. Our family have never had any links with politics. I, I'm a farmer, fourth generation farmer in Essex, but before that, our sort of my um, sort of paternal links come from up in Lancashire and maternal links sort of in, on the Yorkshire side of things, all farming up there. Uh, and I've been at home farming since 2004. And then I went off traveling the world on a Nuffield scholarship looking at sort of soil fertility and, and how we improve our soils. And somehow or another, I tap on the shoulder a few years later, suggested that I maybe could apply for a position on an NFU board. Um, and I, the rest is history, really. So I've been involved with the NFU for about 10 years. I had uh, two years as National Crops Board Chairman, two years as Vice President, two years as Deputy President. And here I am now as President. And I guess what motivates me is, you know, I believe that our role in the NFU is to create the opportunities for our members to have thriving, profitable businesses for the future. Uh, and you know, if we can can leave our mark, then that's something that uh, you know, is a real privilege to be involved with. Good. So you're enjoying it. Oh, look, I like couldn't it. do this job <laughs> if you if you don't enjoy it because yeah, you know yeah. it is absolutely full on. Uh, you know, you have all of the ambition that you think you want to get stuck into, and and the sort of strategic overview of things. But then you have to deal with events, and uh, at the moment, events have very much taken over with this sort of wettest eighteen month period on record. It's having a really negative impact on on the ability of our members to to produce food, but also we're more concerned about the mental health impacts and the pressures that it's putting onto people as well. So, you know, there's some real pressures out there, but obviously, the farm to fork day is about the strategic future. And that's a um, you know, position we do need to, to make sure that we're, we're focusing on, not just the here and now, but also how do we get a better tomorrow? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that takes us nicely into, I mean, there are two main chunks of announcements, as I see it from yesterday. There was the Food Security Index, which we'll start with, which was promised in the last Farm to Fork Summit and is in essentially... It's almost like, I think, a dashboard, nine metrics, um, which pull out the highlights, essentially, from the longer form food security assessment, which has to be produced every three, am I, or is it four years? Three years, yeah. Um, and the next one is due in the end of the year. Um, so we'll have the full account at the end of the year, but this is the sort of, yeah, summary dashboard, if you like. Um Let's start with that, and then we'll go on to talk the second item, the second chunk, which was what's being called the fruit and veg blueprint. Um, so on the index, I think my first question is really, is it um, is it as up to date as it needs to be? Um, I was I noticed that, for example, some of the measures they said, well, this one will be updated in June sort of next month. And it didn't feel to me like it was that sort of current. This is the pulse of the food security situation at the moment that perhaps we might need it to be. Um, so I'm interested in your view on that and particularly perhaps hear some of your reflections on the um, confidence survey, which you published earlier this month where you really, I mean, there were some quite shocking graphs which came out of that, talking, as you say, about the here and now in terms of the current situation that farmers are finding themselves in and the potential implications for food security or production in the UK, at least. 
Yeah. I mean, so the NFU have fought really hard to get this food security index. And if you think back to the health and harmony consultation, which was sort of done under Michael Gove, was going to be the new blueprint for how we spend the sort of money, the BPS money post cap. There was no mention of food production or very, very limited mention of food production. Within the initial agricultural bill, there was very little mention of food production. And so this has been a long journey to get to this point. I think you're right that the food security index is always going to be backward looking. And you know, this is, I guess, my concern with it, is that it's something that we're looking at through the rearview mirror. But to have that annual snapshot of where things are is really important because it does highlight if they're going in the wrong direction, then it starts to create that picture of, well, where do we need to invest? What policies need to be put in place? And, and how do we um, reverse a decline in production? Where are there opportunities for growth? So I think there, there clearly are always going to be limit limitations of something which is backward looking and the data inevitably takes time to produce. So even if it's produced in June, it's probably using last year's data. Mm. And so, you know, it's always going to have that that sort of backward looking feel to it. But I think that we can use it as you know, for a, as a strategic tool as well, really looking at those sectors that, that can be prioritized and where do we need to drive investment in food production for the future. So you know, I think that yeah, we all accept that it's um, it, it's never going to be a, a live document, which is yeah. absolutely on the pulse and, and demonstrating exactly how things are. And unfortunately, in a year's time, there's going to be some really worrying statistics within it because of the production challenges that our members are facing today that will play out over the next year. And I think when we look at the food security index next year, it could uh, show a, a worrying situation. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I just wonder if they could have done a bit more with the narrative to sort of, because all the, the sort of metrics say stable, 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 whereas we kind of know some of this is actually, there's a lot of moving parts on these on these measures. So, I, and I think it'd be interesting, I just wanted to also um, highlight to those listening the that the Energy Climate um, Intelligence Unit have done some quite, neat analysis of um that they've been publishing in the last couple of weeks first of all looking at the expected reduction in wheat barley oat soilseed rate uh production they're looking they anticipating a 20 percent reduction in um supply of uk grown um and that amounting translating into an overall eight percentage point reduction in self-sufficiency so some quite striking figures um and i think i was chatting actually last night we were both at this um evening reception following the farm to fork summit at number 10 chatting to a bread manufacturer who said well yeah we're gonna have to now buy more of our wheat from germany and canada and that's actually gonna increase the price of our product not by a huge amount but you know as you know we're an organization that pay is tracking very closely the ability of all, of uh, citizens to be able to um afford to put food on the table and food prices are um a mount, you know a, a deep concern at the moment um because of this sort of mismatch between people's disposable income and wages not really keeping pace with that that cost of living um, are you, do you, I mean, what's your, uh, do you have any thoughts on that? I think we would have liked to have seen the index capture a little bit more of what's happening at the consumer end. There was, the, there's a metric in there, isn't there, on uh, trust and, I, I can't remember the terminology, but trust essentially in the food system. Um, but that's as far as it went. So I guess the, 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 for, for me, the Food to uh, Farm to Fork Summit is all about uh, the strategic the, and the long term and the ambition. It was never, we never felt it was going to be able to uh, answer the, the critical challenges that members are facing now. The Prime Minister did pick them up in his speech and he recognised that um, you know, there are some really severe challenges that me the members are facing across the country at this moment in time. And you know, we are, we've got conversations ongoing with uh, various different ministers about solutions that could be put in place. I think what's really interesting to me is if you look back over the past two or three years, the way that the importance of food security had risen up the political agenda. And you, you sort of referenced uh, affordability there. And we all know we've seen this huge spike in food price inflation uh, on the back of the tragic situation going on in the Ukraine. I think we're, we're starting to see the impact of climate change globally as well. And, and that, for me, is one of the drivers as to why we need to take control of our food system, 
why we need a strategy for how we're going to feed 70 million people living on an island. Imports will always be a, an important part of that. But where we've got opportunities for growth, we really should be taking those opportunities and saying, well, actually, what are the limiting factors in enabling us to produce more here? And particularly when we when we think about the blueprint for horticulture, you know, there it's highlighted where only 17 percent of our fruit is produced here. Mm -hmm. And I think about 50 percent, 55 percent of our vegetables. And yet we've got a really good climate for producing some of those things. And uh, it's this out of sight, out of mind attitude, you know, producing them in other parts of the world. And particularly in water scarce areas of the world, where we're then importing that water from those countries, and what what impact are we having on on their domestic populations and that exploitative nature of our you know of food production? And I, you know, it's not acceptable. We've got to take um, responsibility for our impact on uh, you know on the world and and how we minimise and mitigate that impact. Yeah, yeah, I I think. I should definitely share your view on that uh, point around that on fruit and veg. Um, before we move on to the blueprint, I just want another area that I just wanted to ask you about in relation to the index. And when I spoke to civil servants about this last night, they said, oh, it'll be explored in the full assessment. But it strikes me that at the moment, farmers are a little bit like, um, doc I'd like to use an analogy of farmers being like doctors. They're dealing with um the symptom a sick patient that's got you know these symptoms of you know dealing with the onslaught of climate change the impacts of climate change on their businesses here and now but as you say the wettest spring on record um and they're firefighting to try and keep their businesses afloat and um make ends meet um th at the same time the doctor has the challenge of trying to stop the disease from spreading, if you like. He's got the vaccination programme up his or her sleeve. And so in the same way, I think farmers have the challenge of transitioning to try and um, do that, play their part, if you like, in this sort of wider system of greenhouse gas, gas emissions, global um, heating and all the implications of that and farmers obviously have a part to play in that and I think probably looking at some of that how the some of the other sectors have decarbonized more rapidly I think the focus isn't is going to increasingly be not so much on farmers specifically but the whole food system and uh food as a sector um so I'm interested at the moment we don't really have essentially what the farming what the index does is it says um this is how well we're dealing with the immediate what the immediate symptom situation is when it's not really telling us how we're getting on with the vaccination program and i would have liked to have seen something in there which is i don't know what that measure is but something which tracks the extent to which um the food system overall is moving in the right direction in terms of reducing its contribution to climate change what do you think about that um, look, for, for most of our members at the moment, Anna, it's about getting to tomorrow. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. and the, the, the focus is really on viability in the absolute immediate future. It's, you know, will they still be in business in 12 months time, 18 months time? And so there are some that are taking that strategic longer term view. But I think we've had a failure, failure of government policy here within the government's net zero 2050 strategy. Elms is highlighted as being one of the key delivery tools. I would say at the moment we we have not got a coherent net zero policy within Elms that is really starting to drive the change that you're talking about. And, and it's as simple initially as how do we engage you know, 85,000 farmers across England in carbon auditing? And how do we make sure they understand their baselines? Because until we're measuring it, we're not managing it. And at the moment, I genuinely feel that there's been a, you know, that the policy has completely overlooked some of the fundamental principles about engaging farmers on the journey. And I don't think there's been a clear understanding of what the role is of that government policy in trying to um, sort of start that nudge theory. Because, you know, I, I sort of, I do have this belief that producing calories will always have an impact. And if we believe that we're going to get food production to zero emissions, then I think we're probably going down the wrong tree. We will only get there by offsetting and you know by building out carbon stocks and uh, and things like that the science behind that at the moment is very sketchy 
And so we can't pin our hope on that. But what we do need to do is absolutely have an ambition to be in the top quartile in the world, have the lowest impact uh, for the food that we're producing here, so that we have a really positive story to tell about the, the food production going on here in the UK. And I think there's a role for government policy in, in trying to drive that understanding initially of what is happening at a farm level and what our contributions are. Um, I think there's also parts of our supply, well, it's sort of our membership, particularly in the red meat sector, that, that do feel pretty victimized by some of this. Um, you know, they, we, we know that we are in the, you know, our, our red meat production has got less than 50% of the global a average from the carbon footprint perspective. So we're doing it really well. And yet we still have a lot of people saying we should be producing less. And my argument would be that like, if we genuinely are, it's sort of in our operational on that top quarter of production, then you end up displacing that production from other parts of the world where they have a higher carbon footprint and you, we export those opportunities and our um, lower footprint to other parts of the world. And so I think that you know we, th this is where climate change and, and glo uh, global heating, which is as you described, Anna, I think that's a really, it's really important we do think about it as global heating because that's what we're trying to stop is the, the heating of the planet. And methane being a short-lived clean greenhouse gas has a big heating impact over that 14 year period. But beyond that, it has no, no heating impact. And we may target methane reductions, but then we'll find when we get to 2050 that we haven't actually solved global heating. And that would be mean that we've gone down the wrong metric, that we've chosen the wrong victim. And, and I, so I think we've got to make sure that we're treating the right patient with your analogy about the, the doctor and the, uh, the vaccine. If, we, if, we, and if, we're not, um, or if we're not treating the right symptoms, then we won't get to the, to the right outcome. And I think that all of us have that shared ambition of needing to, to mitigate global heating in a, in a responsible, targeted way. Uh, while, you know, and I, I think from our membership, what we're trying to say is you drive productivity, you drive efficiency, you, you know, resource use efficiency within your farms and reduce the footprint of your production because that is within your control today. And that is the bit that uh, we are, we absolutely know will lead to less impact on on the world. Um, it will you know, give us a, a really positive to story story to tell about British production. Mm, thank you. Um, I mean, I think I would probably say that the the, the challenge. I mean, you you got okay. into. I wasn't intending to get into the meat conversation today, but you touched on it. Um, is is um, as much about how we can. Um, shift a little bit of demand in favor of the veg and the the veg and the pulses essentially some of that meat substitution if you like but for we'd really like to see any of that switch happen in a way which really optimizes health as well as environmental impacts because you've got potential for real win-wins there um but to your point um unless because you mentioned sort of imported unless we get the trade story sorted out so that we're not in a situation where um, cheap imported meat produced to lower standards is simply going to um, uh, uh, upset any efforts to try and move consumers in the right direction, then uh, we lose on, on all fronts. We lose both on the quality of our diets and on the extent to which we have a thriving farming culture. So I think there are obviously multiple levers that need to be pulled at once for this to work in the way that I think we'd all hope that, that it would. And and at the moment, they, that's there's not much sign that that's going to happen. So well, on the trade policy stuff. piece, uh, yeah, on the trade policy piece there, Anna, you know, we, we are sort of trying to build a coalition of the willing at the moment about sort of implementing core standards within trade. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, ourselves and the WWF have come out publicly saying that we should be, you know, implementing those core standards. But I think there is a, a, a very strange but useful coalition coming together behind that that um, you know, will be quite a powerful voice and saying, you know, if we want systems change here in the UK, if you're not very careful, all you do is offshore that production. Mm -hmm. And then you don't drive the systems change because you put those farms out of business. And so it's got to be a joined up strategic approach you know, with a, an umbrella that sits over it, which has a coherent outcome. And at the moment, we have, don't have that coherent sort of policy pulled together in one place. Yeah. And just to remind everyone, you talked a little bit in your earlier comment about um, sort of not taking taking farmers with the policy process sufficiently. Um, just give us the stats on. So we're now, I think I gleaned from Nick's thread that we're 50 percent or below in terms of BPS payments compared to 
um, 2020. Um, and what proportion of farmers have joined the or benefiting from the SFI at the moment? Yeah, so I mean, we by the twenty twenty, I mean, yeah, by the twenty twenty four year, we'll be between fifty and seventy percent of our BPS payments, depending on the size of your business, will have been um, taken away and reinvested in the new Elm scheme. Um, and at the moment, less than twenty five percent of farm businesses have access to the sustainable farming incentive. Right. So that that's where the money has gone into the sustainable farming incentive and into productivity grant schemes. But less than 25% of members are in that scheme. So look, the, what the ambitions of DELMS are laudable. What I what we haven't seen is what the impact assessments demonstrate from DEFRA. And, and when I talk about the impact assessments, we want to look at what are, what are the impacts on the number of farmers. We know we've got 7,000 less farm businesses now than we did in 2019. What is the impact on food production? And what are the expectations for nature recovery, biodiversity, um, and yeah, meeting those environmental, uh, legislated environmental targets. We have not seen those impact assessments. And it, it feels like we are um, sort of blind, you know, blindly walking into the abyss, not knowing what, what, where we're heading. And I think, again, this comes back to that need for that strategic overview. And mm -hmm. I, 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 I genuinely believe that if, if those impact assessments have been done, if DEFRA are happy that the outcomes that those impact assessments show are the ones that they want, there's nothing to hide from those impact assessments. Uh, and what we've seen in Wales very recently was a, a really strong pushback from the farming community and the, and the processing sector around the proposed sustainable farming uh, scheme. But that was, they had a consultation there. They had all of the impact assessments. They knew that they would lose potentially five and a half thousand jobs. They knew that there'd be a reduction of 120,000 livestock units. And, and that then led to this really strong pushback. And actually yesterday, uh, the Welsh uh, Minister has announced that they will be pausing the, the introduction for another year. Uh, so there will be no, you know, there'll, there'll be no new scheme until 2026 uh, because of the strength of that feeling around the scheme proposals that were being made. So I, I think that there is a, um, I, I do feel that we are walking blind into this, into these outcomes at the moment. We don't know where we're going, and I don't know if Defra know where we're going. And I, you know, we would love to see those impact assessments. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on to fruit and veg. Um, so the other big package yesterday was this fruit and veg blueprint. Um, we were really excited to see some of this because we've been calling for a, hort a horticulture strategy for some time now. The, hort the strategy as such has been kind of parked as an idea, but there are some really nice elements of this package which has been proposed yesterday. So including, just for everyone's benefit, um, the what was the um, fruit and veg producer scheme, I'm probably getting the terminology a little bit wrong, but um, it shifted, which we've kind of taken over post-Brexit, but doubling the size of that to 80 million pounds, which is essentially a fund for investment in collaborative uh, business activity, but also now single businesses can benefit from that investment pot, as far as I understand. Tell me if I'm wrong in just a second. And then, um, then other elements around investment for um, orchards, um, for internal drainage, um, for... Um, pack houses and so forth, investment pots for that. And also this interesting Farmgate Food Waste Fund, £15 million. I don't really know what that is, who gets that money, but you'll probably be able to fill us in on that. Um, but does this what does does this amount to enough? What what's your view on it? And first and foremost, that we really welcome the focus on the ability the need and the ability to grow the horticultural sector. Uh, we we produced our 10-point growth strategy last year because DEFRA had shelved their intentions to do, um, you know, to, to provide a growth strategy. And so look, we we really do welcome the uh, the announcements. The £80 million is a doubling of the funding that, that was available under the producer organisations. Um, we still have questions about whether the scale of that is enough, but that we need to look at the detail of who is going to be eligible and, and what's going to be eligible within it. And you know, we, our horticultural team, believe we may be needed nearer 200 million uh, within that. But when you look at the 80 million pounds on producer organisations, last week there was an announcement of 50 million pounds for automation within the horticultural sector. Uh, there was also the seasonal worker scheme announcement last week. And you start to bring this package together 
which does create far more confidence that they will have the tools at their disposal to 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 drive those viable thriving uh, horticultural businesses i think the the element that's probably still missing is this fairness in the supply chain angle mm -hmm. so we know that there's been an investigation going on into the fairness in the horticultural supply chain uh, and i think that the only limiting factor now from for members um, sort of really grabbing the bull by the horns and, and making that investment is the ability to, to, to drive profitable um, returns from the sector. And that probably now is the is the last outstanding challenge. And but you know, there are there are some in the sector who who will you know, be really pleased and will be driving forwards with investment on the back of what they've heard over the past uh, sort of 10 days and those announcements. And the 15 million pounds that you talk about there. Now, I think that this may have been an announcement that was made at the NFU conference, actually, uh, around 15 million pounds for trying to um, reduce um, end of um, reduce waste at a farm level. Uh, and I think it was going to be made available to some of the charities potentially. Uh, but I, 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 know, I know that um, our horticultural team have met with uh, a few of the charities that are looking at to access this, but I don't know a lot more detail than that. But I right. think I imagine that that may be a, 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 one of those announcements that's been made a couple of times. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the classic recycling. <laughs> um, so um, just to add, I think yeah, as I said, I think um, this is a good a good step forward in terms of an offer on the production side. What we would really love to see, I mean, we've done the sort of maths in terms of thinking about if we were to, when you look at the Eat Well Guide, the government's sort of guidance on healthy eating, 40% of the plate needs to be fruit and veg. And that amounts to, um, actually it amounts to seven portions of fruit and veg a day when you look at the numbers behind that, that visual. Um, so we've sort of done the maths in terms of, well, what if we had a food supply that amounted to seven portions of fruit and veg a day? So that's a, an 89% increase in our fruit and veg supply. So quite a significant jump in increase, a, a, a significant increase. I think our, th our thinking is let's, you know, yeah, let's really think about how we can have, um, grow the slice of the, fruit and veg pie, if you like, which is UK grown. We, as you say, we've got some incredible produce that we can produce here. But also, how do we grow the size of the overall pie, if you like? Um, and uh, I'm really thinking about a horticulture strategy from the pers perspective of both production and consumption and thinking about all those opportunities which, which government has to link production and consumption whether it's through you know um what happens in nurseries and how kids are taught to taste and experience different fruits and vegetables whether it's how we feed our kids in school whether it's the wider public procurement whether it's the healthy start scheme which provides vouchers for fruit and veg and what if we were to link that to british growers this is school fruit and veg scheme again a lot of imported fruit used into that well what if we looked at that scheme differently it seems to me that there's a huge wealth of opportunity to link production and consumption in a horticulture strategy what do you think about that no i, I can't disagree with any of that Anna. and I, I think one of the things here is that in those formative years in your childhood the tastes that you get used to at that point are the tastes that you'll continue to want to consume further through um, your adult life and so if you you know if we prioritize british grown at that early stage then there's far more likelihood that demand for British vegetables, with British um, yeah, fruit will continue through that cycle. But looking at the, how we can utilize public procurement to drive better, better sourcing of British, uh, there's a project going on at the moment. I think it'll be reporting imminently, actually. So Will Quince has been brought in to do that, Will Quince MP um, on behalf of Steve Barclay. And it'll be really interesting to see what they come up with there. But trying to link you know, healthy outcomes to that public funding that's going into the dietary choices of today, it, it should be a, an absolute no brainer. Uh, and you know, so, and then you look at the scale and the scope within that horticultural demand that, and, and how we can, can produce a, as much of that here as possible. And it becomes a really, really exciting story. Um, so I, I do think, again, this is where trying to link departments across government is really difficult. But you've got the Department for Health, Department for Education. Yeah, they all need to be part of this story. And you know, MOD with their sourcing policy. And it it, it, it does become pol uh, quite complicated. But that doesn't mean it should be impossible. Yeah. You know? And I think we've got to say, look, what is the ambition for the future? 
you know, when you know that obesity is costing over 100 billion pounds a year, and we're probably only at the scratching the surface of that at the moment, we've yeah. got to say at some point we're going to do this differently. And and I think that you know, if for the future of of a healthy uh, society, but also you know the pressures on the NHS and everything else, somebody is going to have to be brave at some point and say we're going to do it and we're going to go for it. Yeah, well, that's a brilliant note to end on, Tom. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Really enjoyed talking to you and um, hope you have a very good day and that it's not as hectic as yesterday. And thanks, everybody, for joining. The uh, recording will be sent round. Um, do, as ever, send us your feedback on email on how we can improve these, these uh, webinars. We always want to, to hear what you're thinking. So thanks, everyone, and have a great day.